Claremont run has been more than a few times, singled out for the presence of queer subtext. What that means is complicated, and what that means for the X-Men universe, equally so. The term queer is both frequently contested and frequently misunderstood. It can be a synonym for homosexual, or it can be a complex nexus of non-normative behaviors. For our purposes, let's use the following description offered in Meg John Barker and Julia Shields' text, Queer, A Graphic History, who suggests that queer, quote, can operate as an umbrella term for people outside of the heterosexual norm, or for people who challenge the LGBT mainstream. Though as the authors make clear, this is just one possible definition. In the interest of saving time, let's bypass centuries of literary theory on the subject of subtext and look to Wikipedia for a good functional definition. Quote, subtext is any content of a creative work which is not announced explicitly by the characters or author, but is implicit or becomes something understood by the observer of the work as the production unfolds. Subtext has been used historically to imply controversial subjects without drawing the attention or wrath of censors. So when we talk about queer subtext in X-Men comics, we're talking about the ways in which Claremont and his team created implicit representations of characters outside of the heterosexual norm that so dominated mainstream culture of the time, and even still today. In his Eisner Award-winning book, The New Mutants, Superheroes and the Radical Imagination of American Comics, Ramsey Fawaz declares that X-Men, quote, articulated mutation to the radical critiques of identity promulgated by the cultures of women's and gay liberation. End quote. Fawaz would also later describe the, quote, alternative mutant kinships, end quote, of superhero stories as, quote, the epitome of queer world making, end quote. In each of these arguments, Fawaz's point is that the fundamental setup of X-Men comics, the found family of persecuted outcasts, is innately queer. The term that Fawaz uses is queer mutanity. So intentional or not, this foundation leaves X-Men comics in a dynamic position from which to explore non-canonical queer relationships in the comics form. The examples are, frankly, far more than we have time to cover. But let's start with Yukio to build a baseline. Yukio is introduced to X-Men comics as an androgynous romantic foil to Mariko in pursuit of Wolverine's affections. Shortly thereafter, she has a chance encounter with Storm that features a series of romantic trappings, but anything beyond that transpires off the panel. Storm comes back from this encounter with an entirely new costume and style, one that bears signifiers of queer culture. Andrew Wheeler of Comics Alliance writes that, quote, Storm's transformation from elemental goddess to mohawk leather punk is one of the queerest stories ever told in comics, end quote. While Jay Edidin of Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men states the issue even more directly, quote, they are 100% totally doing it, end quote. Regardless, Whatever happened off-panel in her encounter with Yukio, it was life-altering for Storm, as reflected in UXM Annual Number 11, where all the X-Men are granted visions of their deepest desires, and Storm's is Yukio. Similar queer sexual subtext has been read into a number of other key X-Men relationships, including Wolverine Nightcrawler, Wolverine Cyclops, Storm Kitty, Storm Callisto, Storm Jean, Kitty Oyana, Kitty Rachel, Professor X Magneto, and many others. Furthermore, this practice of reading same-sex desire into X-Men is readily manifest in fan fiction culture surrounding the series, which shows a preference for same-sex relationships. That said, the strongest queer subtext in the series, so strong in fact that it's hard to call it implicit, is that which we see in the Mystique-Destiny relationship. Throughout the entirety of the series, they are only identified as good friends, thus falling into what is commonly referred to as the gal-pal trope. Claremont named Mystique after The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan, a foundational text of second wave feminism which specifically went after the concept of forced domestic servitude, the widespread idea that women belong in the home, or perhaps the kitchen. Personifying that in a villain is tricky, for fear of villain coding the feminist ideals you're espousing, but Mystique is a popular and dynamic anti-hero as much as a villain, and can thus be read as a progressive badass feminist, more so for being a little villainous and her relationship with Destiny thus falls into the same heroically transgressive politics. Destiny's death, a sacrifice to protect Mystique, is rendered with gravitas, weight, and beauty. It's one of the most heartbreaking scenes in the entire series. Later we see Mystique grieving Destiny by using her shape-shifting power to simulate Destiny's aging over the course of what is revealed to have been decades of shared life, with Irene aging while Mystique's powers kept her from doing so in parallel. And still they stayed together 
even raising the X-Men rogue together as a family. If nothing else, the grace with which Claremont writes this one relationship is testament to the sincerity and empathy that informed, to some degree, all of his depictions of queer subtext. Now, the most inarguable assertion of modern media consciousness is the notion that representation matters, as we asserted in our previous video as well. And at a time when queer representation in mainstream comics was forbidden, Claremont found a way to tell stories about queer characters who mattered to him and to the audience who discovered them in turn. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the Claremont Run, you can follow us on Twitter at Claremont Run, or visit us on the web at www.claremontrun.com.